Good morning and welcome to First Presbyterian Church. We are very happy to have you here with us the second Sunday in Advent. And I have a special guest you'll see in a minute, my wife Susan Arnold, which many of you, uh, many of you know her. She's here today and going to uh, help with both lighting the Advent candle and co-officiating communion with me. And I wanted to flag that now because uh, you might want to pause the video and go get something you can use for communion later in the service. And that way, when we get to it, we can just flow right into that, and you don't have to interrupt your worship experience to go grab some bread and juice or crackers and juice or something uh, to use for communion. So you might want to do that right now. A couple quick announcements going on. First off, many thanks to everybody who either posted or shared about the blood drive or came in and gave. We had several members who gave. And despite having uh, five of our regular givers out of the picture, we still got, I think, 15 units of blood, which that's awesome because uh, that's, that's as many as we've normally gotten when everyone can participate. So things are just, we're ramping up with that. We're getting more and more folks. We'll do it again and again and again. Uh, so again, thank you so much. Also, we have a time change for yoga. We're moving yoga from 6.30 to 6 p.m. It's the same uh, day, Tuesday during the week. Same link, same password. If you need any of that, you can contact me or go to our website and there's a link you can press uh, that will, uh, if you look for the yoga page on our, our website, you'll find a link to be able to get that information. And I think that's about all I have in terms of announcements this week. Continue to pray as cases are on the rise around coronavirus. Uh, I am happy to say that Susan Weeks is no longer uh, at home because of coronavirus, still needs prayers because it's a long haul to get her energy back but she is back at work and we are grateful for that. And uh, she has, her sisters are fighting coronavirus right now, so our prayers, Susan and family, continue to be with you. And I, again, I think that's all I have announcement-wise. Why don't we go ahead and move into worship this morning by listening to a prelude. And as is our custom, as it's become during this pandemic time, we kind of gather our minds together by taking a big collective breath. So I invite you to take in a big breath with me and then let it out. And as you do so, just let go of anything that might distract you. Maybe you've had a busy week, you're scrambling to get some things ready for Christmas. Let's just set that all to the side right now so that we can 100% be available for God for worship because God is always 100% here for us. And this is our opportunity to give that time and attention back. Enjoy the prelude.
in this season of Advent, we're here to watch and wait and pray for the coming of light into the world. We long for the day when the things of darkness, selfishness and greed, suffering and oppression shall be no more. On this second Sunday of Advent, we light the candle of peace. This candle is a reminder that peace is available for all who turn from darkness and turn toward the light of the world, Jesus Christ. God God of peace, peace, we we turn turn to you in in repentance. repentance. May May your your word be a lamp to our feet and a light on our path. path. An ever-present reminder of your peace that that passes all all understanding. understanding. Lord, by by your your presence, light up the past that that we we might might learn from from it with with thankfulness. Light up the present that that we might live in it with love. Light up the future that we might prepare for it in the hope. As we watch and wait and pray, may we always be ready to encounter the Lord, who is already and always with us. Amen. And please join me in singing our opening hymn. God's Word is full of promises, and of all the promises in there, perhaps one of the greatest is simply this. God said, this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, I will write it upon their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I will forgive their evil deeds, and I will remember their sin no more. Friends, knowing that God is a faithful God and desires to forgive us, let us humble ourselves and come before God praying this prayer of confession, saying, Faithful God, we confess that we have not led lives of holiness. We suffer from impatience, apathy, and greed. We have not been at peace. We repent of these offenses and turn to you in love. Forgive our iniquity and pardon our sins that we may walk in righteousness to the glory of your name. And hear now our silent confessions to you, O God. Amen. Take comfort in these words as well. Brothers and sisters, by the mercy of Christ, your sins are forgiven. For salvation is at hand for all who turn to God. Praise be to God for his steadfast love and forgiveness.
And let's honor God right now for, for his forgiveness by singing together the glory of Hatri. join me in affirming what we believe using the Apostles' Creed, saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's take a moment and pray together before we look at God's Word this morning. Please join me. Most holy God, as we turn our attention to your word, we come with hearts and minds ready and willing to learn. May your Holy Spirit illuminate your word for us that we might see in it truths that maybe we've never quite seen before, or perhaps we will capture them at a depth we have not captured them before. Lord, also be with me that as I speak, that what I'm doing is giving a right, true, and a, and a fitting interpretation of what your word is for us today. May your Holy Spirit move between your word, my words, and the hearts of people listening, that we might become better disciples because of it. In Christ's name, we offer this time, amen. I want to invite you to follow along with me. Uh, we're going to be looking at Psalm 85, and I'm going to be reading the whole psalm. The lectionary writers, uh, for those of you who don't know, we tend to follow what's called lectionary. It's a set of kind of prescribed readings that run a three-year cycle, and they have a tendency to skip over verses that I don't think they like, and we're not going to leave those out, because some of the greatest learning are in the hard sayings, if you will, okay? Then the stuff that, that we kind of don't want to hear. Uh, and in this particular instance, the lectionary wanted to chop out verses uh, 3 through 7, and uh, we're not going to do that. So listen now to God's holy word. And this is, by the way, this is the passage I'll be focusing on for preaching, so um, pay maybe extra special attention here. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the for fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all their sin. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God, of our salvation and put away our indig your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again so that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O God, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak. For he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. 
The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and will make a path for his steps. And then we're also reading this morning from 2 Peter and the third chapter starting at the 8th verse. And I'm going to put a, put a marker where we just were so that if I want to reference it while, while we're exploring it, I can flip to it quickly. And I keep flipping right by 2 Peter. There we go. Again, I'm in chapter 3, beginning at the 8th verse. But do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, what sort of persons ought you to be in leading lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set ablaze and dissolved and the elements will melt with fire. But in accordance with his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness is at home. Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting for these things, strive to be found by peace, by him at peace, without spot or blemish, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. So also our beloved brother Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Well, right now, we're standing in a time it's pretty fitting to a core theme of Advent. We are standing in a time between promises and the fulfillment of promises, that messy middle where we have to kind of try to wait and be patient, like was emphasized both in this second reading um, and actually is behind the scenes in the first reading that we'll be focusing on. But it was very front and center in Second Peter where he was talking about, you know what? You know, a day is like a thousand years. To God, a thousand years is like a day. You're just going to have to be patient. You know, like His, His promises are coming. And that's a big, big theme of Advent as we wait for Christmas to come and we kind of celebrate how God in the past gave promises that a Messiah was coming. And sure enough, God fulfilled those promises. And we have promises that a kingdom is coming eventually where there will be a new heaven and a new earth and we'll have sort of a, a recreation of everything, if you will, where there won't be any more tears or anguish or poverty or suffering. All that stuff's going to go away. And we're kind of in this messy middle between the, the we're like a half step into that promise. And we're going to see in the psalm that that psalm was written by people who were in a very similar place. They were like a half step into a promise where they... God had partially begun to answer that. And I'll just hang on to that. That's where we're going. But where we're, why we're spending time on this is we're going to learn today one way to stand very solid, very strong and straight in the midst of waiting. How do we not fall off balance? How do we not lose our balance and fall over in the midst of trying to stand solid in faithfulness while we're waiting. And I said, that's fitting right now. We're in a time like that because I'm gonna, I want to ask you something. How many discussions have you had this week or how many news stories have you seen that have to do with a vaccine coming and coming soon? I cannot even count how many conversations or news stories that I have seen. We are living in this place 
of we have this promise of we're, we've got a vaccine coming and it's coming soon. Such and such company, they're going to release their trials now. So and so has done this many trials and theirs will come out and they're going to go to these people and they're going to go to those people. And the promise is very imminent. But most of us are standing around still waiting. And while we're waiting, we're having to live and deal with the lack of a vaccine. And I don't know anybody who's not sick and tired of that. You know, like who's just not, they want the vaccine yesterday or something to happen. So this pandemic mess is over. We are solidly stuck in the middle between promise and fulfillment of promise. And the problem with being in that place is you still have to deal with life without the promise fulfilled. And we are that way as a people of God. We kind of live in that space. We live in a space of, you know, we had promises that we have this promise or promises around a kingdom that's coming a new heaven and a new earth as I described and we have promises of our sins being forgiven and our sin has been covered our sin has been covered in Christ and we have been made a part of God's family we sort of have taken a step toward coming home if you will by being adopted through Jesus Christ into God's family, but we ain't quite there yet, are we? You know, like we're still living with daily life, waiting for the fulfillment, the full expression of God's kingdom and Christ's return. That's where we live. And that is a really similar place to where God's people were who wrote Psalm 85. In their instance, this is what it looked like. This was in an early, now don't glaze over on me, I'm going to say some words here that I'll unpack, early post-exilic time that this was written. What that means is, this was written most likely right after the people of God finally got to come back to Jerusalem after having been ousted from the promised land by God because of their unfaithfulness for 70 years. You know, just very, very quick rehab, uh, recap, if you don't know that story, God's people, they were in Egypt, life was good, life turned sour, got bad really quickly, you know, Pharaoh came down on these people, God rescued them out of Egypt, they wandered in the wilderness, they landed in a promised land finally, and after they'd been in the promised land for a while, they started attributing the goodness of their life to other gods, foreign gods from that, the peoples in that land. They started forgetting that God was the one who delivered them. And they started neglecting the Sabbath of the land. And they started neglecting God's commandments. And God said, enough is enough, eventually. And he removed them from the land for 70 years. He through other entities, through foreign powers, had armies come in, took them from the land, they were carried away into exile where they lived in a foreign land for 70 years. Now imagine for a moment, what if we had to wait for a vaccine for 70 years? I like can't even, I don't, I, I hate the fact I even said that. <laughs> like it just makes my stomach turn to like, Oh my gosh. But these folks, they were removed for land for 70 years. And this psalm is written probably from what we can tell right after they have finally gotten back to the land. Because you'll notice, notice what they said. We see that reflected in the first couple verses. It says, Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. If we did a little bit researching through the um, Old Testament, whenever you hear a reference to the fortunes of Jacob, what they're talking about is the promised land and being, you restored us to the promised land. You forgave the iniquity of your people. So he's like, God said, okay, 
You neglected my Sabbath. You turned away from me. I'm forgiving that. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your anger. So God has, he has begun the healing process from his end of saying, I am beginning to forgive you and I'm going to allow you back to the land. But you'll notice very quickly, if we read on in that, that they're not quite there yet. Like they're back in the promised land. They're back to Jerusalem. But you know what? The temple has been destroyed and nobody's been there. Well, that's not entirely true. There have been some people, there were people left behind to tend the land. That's a whole nother sermon. It's a cool sermon, but that's a whole nother sermon. But they've come back and only a remnant have come back. This is where we start to get language about a faithful remnant because not everybody came back. After 70 years of being in a foreign land, some of them said, you know what? I kind of, I'm, I'm not going to mess with going back. This is home to me. I'm staying here. We can wander from God and we can be away from God so long that we will make a home someplace away from God. And that's a, that's a terrible place for us to wind up. Well, some of the folks opted for that. God forgave them, invited them back home, and they got back. So now there's only a remnant of them. Things are kind of a mess, and there's going to have to be a whole lot of like rolling up sleeves, rebuilding the wall of the temple, and reestablishing a home in their homeland. So they're in this icky kind of middle between the promises started to be answered like we have, our sins been forgiven, our sins are covered, God's turned away from his iniquity, but yet we live dealing with daily life and the evil that goes on in daily life and our sin and other people's sin because we've not fully been yet restored. And in the next few verses, the part the lectionary wanted to cut out, that's where the psalmist, he's, he's kind of having about a four-verse pity party. Like, you know, he's, he's realizing, Lord, you answered our prayer. Oh, God, you have answered our prayer. Now we're back home. And it's kind of hard because it's not the way it was when we were there before. So when are you going to stop being mad at, at us fully is really what he's saying when he says things like, um, uh, like when he says, will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again so that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love. So, like, he acknowledges, you have brought us back. I mean, he says it. You were favorable to us. You forgave us. You withdrew us. But are you going to stay mad at us forever? He doesn't feel as if God has fully fulfilled promise. And they aren't fully restored yet, are they? So, they're living in that messy middle that we're living on. And the next part of that psalm is really important and there's a, an important lesson for us because I think it's what the psalmist does next that gives us a window into how to stand solid and not lose our balance when we're in that difficult place of waiting. Waiting on, waiting for, waiting really with the Lord because He's never away from us but waiting. And this is it. The psalmist fixes his eyes on something particular. And I, and I want to talk about that for a moment, about the, the power of fixing your eyes on something to stay balanced. And then we'll look at specifically what this psalmist focuses on, what we can focus on. So I'm going to... It'll seem like I'm digressing for a moment, but I'm not. I want to, ex I want to share with you a, a principle. It's actually something I learned from yoga, and I think it's honestly what this guy's doing in the psalm, is who helps someone maintain their balance. Earlier today, this morning, I was exercising, and I'm doing a new routine. I'm on my third go at this new routine, a series of about six or eight movements you do in a circuit over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And they've added this move that I've been having a terrible time with called a drop lunge. And for those of you who don't know it, I'm, when you're doing this, and it's going to be hard to show this in a row, I'll turn it kind of sideways, but I'm holding two dumbbells 
And what you do, and I'm actually going to hold on to this just to show you so I don't like fall over into the tree or something. But you step back and you touch a knee to the ground and you step back up and you're holding two dumbbells. Well, I've been very, very unsteady in that. It's been driving me crazy. It's been the hardest part of that routine for me until today. And today I was doing it and I thought, you know what, this is crazy. I balance in yoga all the time. We do this thing called tree pose where you stand on one foot and you bring your other foot up into your calf or above the knee and you stand there. Like, here I am, I'm just standing there doing that. I do that all the time and I don't have a problem. And there's a secret sauce we have in yoga to help you do that. And <laughs> that can be like flipping a switch between, I've got this is called tree pose, I've got a wobbly tree that's you know, about to fall all over the place, or as I like to say, I'm falling out of my tree, um, or you're standing there solid. And what we do is, the little trick, the technique is, we find what's called a drishti. And a drishti is, it's a focal point. It's something to focus on that is unmoving. So you find a spot on the wall, or maybe the floor, or a piece of furniture, but you find some fixed point slightly out in front of you, you stare solidly at that, and then you take your pose and you keep your eyes on that point. And I have watched people wobbling all over the place and said, well listen, find a drishti, find a fixed point to focus your gaze on, and I've watched them go from woo to all of a sudden like boom, they're just standing there solid. Um, in fact, one person told me they learned that in yoga and they were in, uh, they were in a, um, water exercise class and they were having trouble balancing and they picked the drishti and all of a sudden, boom, it's like, oh my gosh, I can be, I can be in balance in this water. Well, today I did that and suddenly this exercise that was just kicking me all over the place because I couldn't hold my balance in, suddenly it became very, very easy because I had a fixed point to look on. And I'm sharing all this, and I had an aha around that um, that is kind of related to this, kind of not. I was realizing, you know what, when you have a focal point, it becomes like a guiding principle. It becomes a guiding, like a north star for you when you have a focal point that not only gives you balance, but it keeps you from getting off course. And what this psalmist did today is, to me, in the last third-ish, uh, last half of the psalm, basically he kind of declared or grabbed hold of a drishti. And his drishti is, what do I know to be true about God? Or what do I know to be true? And he decided to fix his attention on the truth rather than, this feels really bad. I don't like the way things are right now. And being lost in his three verse pity party, right? He shifts and the shifting point happens when he says these words, let me hear what God the Lord will speak. Let me hear what the God, what God the Lord will speak. He shut his mouth, okay? <laughs> and he decided rather than me going on and on about how I don't like things, I'm gonna listen. Because I know this. I'm adding those words in there. But he begins to make declarations. This is his drishti. This is his focal point. This is, he grabs hold of, he decides to fix his attention on what he knows to be true. He says this, the Lord will speak. For he will speak peace. He knows that God will speak peace. And when you hear the word speak in the Old Testament, to speak is to kind of do. It's, um, it's very, very active. You know, like when God spoke, creation came into being. It's a very dynamic word that implies action and results and things happening. And what he says is, God will speak peace, meaning God will create peace. When God opens God's mouth, things happen. And I know this, God will speak peace to those who turn their hearts to him. And what he's doing is, Rather than casting his eyes all over the place at, oh, the temple walls are broken down. Oh, my goodness, the land is a mess. Oh, my goodness, there's only a few of us. He was 
sending his gaze all over the place, what he's saying is, hang on a minute. Let's turn our eyes on him. Let's turn our hearts on him who we know is steadfast and faithful. And he says, surely, listen to the confidence in that, surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, for those who revere God, for those who look to God, for those who their focus is on God, surely salvation is at hand. And he just declares what he 100% believes is true, and he's going to cling to that as a drishti, as a focal point. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. They're coming. There's no doubt about it. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground. Righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and will make a path for his steps. Did you just again and again? This will happen, this will happen, that will happen, that will happen. It's not, I hope it may, or it could, or it might. <laughs> you know, he's speaking with in tremendous confidence that God's steadfast love, his right, righteousness, his faithfulness, these things will happen undoubtedly. And we're going to turn our hearts, we're going to fix our gaze on that, and that is going to help us stand rock solid to where we are unwavering. We're not going to get lost in our three verse, five verse, 10 or 20 verse pity party. Okay, it's okay to say, God, I, this is driving me crazy. I can't stand it. It's horrible. I'm sick of waiting. You know, in essence, I want that vaccine now. Don't we all? You know? <laughs> But at the end of the day, we know the end of the story. We know God's in control. And if we don't want to get lost in a quagmire of frustration and weariness, whatever the situation may be where we find ourselves waiting, it may not be this pandemic. It may be something else. You may, have, you may feel like you're in a waiting room with God around something else. But know this, and know this to be true. God's steadfast love stands forever. His promises are true in Jesus Christ. We can turn our gaze to the Lord because His grace is sufficient for us. That's one of the promises of the Word of God. His grace is sufficient for all things. We can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. But that's where our focus has to be, folks. If our focus isn't there... If it's wandering around to, I'm worried about this, I'm scared about that, I don't know about this, oh my gosh, what about it? What if, what if, what if, what if? Forget the what ifs. Focus on the, yes, but this is real and true. Jesus Christ is the Lord of life. Jesus Christ is not dead, but alive. Jesus Christ forgives my sin. Jesus Christ has overcome death, and He will establish us in His kingdom. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. We will see an end to suffering. We will see the establishment of a kingdom where God will be in our midst and we will be in God's midst forever. If we focus on that, all this other stuff is inconsequential. And right now, it may feel like a thousand years, but in God's eyes, and once we're in God's kingdom, it'll be but a day, if that. It'll be a blink of the eye. Our life, our span of life, the things we go through, the ups and downs, the woes of it, while it is wondrous and precious and magical and this incredible miracle that God has given us, at the, when in Placed in comparison to eternity with God, it is a blink of an eye. This too shall pass, but what God has promised will stand and last forever in Jesus Christ. Praise be to God for that blessing. And let us stand faithful. Let our drishti be the Lord. And may we never, ever turn our eyes away from that and become a lost people. Amen, and join me in some prayer. Most holy God, 
life throws at us a lot of waiting games. And we're not always faithful in those games. Today, we pray that through Your Word, though, we are inspired to turn our eyes to You. That tomorrow morning when we wake up, rather than being frustrated about how things aren't the way that we want them in some corner of our lives, we would give gratitude for what is in our lives. That we would turn to You and we would say, where is the Lord blessing me and faithful right now? We would turn our hearts to You. And not only would we turn our hearts to You using the language of the psalmist, that's what he talked about, your salvation is going to come to those who turn your, their hearts to You, but also that we would fear You, which that word really means that we would revere You, that we would stand in awe of You that we would draw into a place of prayer at times where we are overwhelmed by a profound sense of the wonder and the mystery of who You are. That the eternity of You, Your divine nature, would wash over us in such a way that it would just bring to us that peace that surpasses all understanding that we would find whatever murmuring voices are kind of bubbling up inside of us, that the fire that is causing that to boil would be snuffed out. And instead, Lord, we would just be listening to Your voice because we know that You will speak peace. In Your word, peace, God, in the Bible, it doesn't just mean an absence of conflict. It means that all is right, all is good, all is well. And you are going to speak, you are going to create, you are going to voice into being peace in the fullest sense of shalom, to use an Old Testament word for that. We thank you, God, for your faithfulness. May we be a faithful covenant people. May you find us standing before You with steadfast hearts just as Your steadfast faithfulness is always there for us. God, I'm going to pause for just a moment in silence for each one of us to lift up to You whatever is maybe a waiting game for us right now. This is our moment to have a kind of a three verse, you know, God, this is what's heavy on me right now. I'm going to pause in silence for us to lift those things up to you. Lord, all these things we have just lifted up to You, we let go of them. Instead, we fix our gaze on this simple truth. Surely, the salvation of the Lord God will come to those who turn their hearts upon You. And we turn our hearts upon You and await faithfully Your salvation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, thank you for being here in worship today. Normally, right now, we would take up an offering. That's an opportunity for us to support ministry of the church here. It's also a way of kind of saying thanks for all that God's giving, given us. It's also a way of showing faithfulness. When we let go of a portion of what God's giving us, it's, it's a way of saying, you know what, God, I know you're going to provide for all, all my needs. I don't have to cling to every single thing in my life. If you would like to do that today, though we are not gathered physically with one another, you can do that two other ways. You can make an offering by mailing a gift to P.O. Box 214, Walnut Ridge, Arkansas, 72476. 
or you can go online to our website at fpcwalnutridge.org forward slash give. And when you get to that page, you're going to see a very big obvious button that you can press to make a gift. When you press that button, it's going to redirect you to a safe, uh, secure site where you'll enter some information and can make a tax-deductible contribution online. It's easy and quick. And as I said, safe. So thank you for your gifts in advance. And let's take a moment right now together and honor God from whom all these gifts flow and come by singing together the doxology. dedicating the gifts that we have offered today. Holy God, we commend these gifts to You. We place them in Your hands and ask for Your blessing upon them. We want each one of these gifts to be multiplied and to bring You glory and honor and praise. We want these gifts to grow and touch hearts and lives with Your good news that those who are in darkness would find light. To that end, we pray and offer our gifts today. In Christ's name, Amen. Now let's prepare our hearts now to gather together at God's table for communion, and we're going to do that with a communion hymn. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. And we are told that in God's kingdom, people are going to come from east and west and north and south, and they're going to gather at this great table. And what a wonderful thing for us to be able to gather as family during this pandemic at a table, even if it's virtually, and be reminded that we are one family with one faith, one baptism, one hope in Jesus Christ. Now, in the New Testament, after Jesus' resurrection, there is a time where he was walking along with the disciples. They didn't recognize him until they broke bread with him, as they had done many times before. And in that moment, their eyes were open and they saw him for who he was. And I raise that up because, in a sense, that's why we're here today. We're not just remembering something that happened long ago, but every time we take part in communion together, our eyes are once again opened and we have the opportunity to receive and experience the grace of Jesus Christ right here and right now. And it's also a time of looking forward to the fulfillment of all of God's promises when He comes again. Friends, let us pray. The Lord be with you and, and also, also with, with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We, we lift them, them to, to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, is right, right to, to give, give our thanks and praise. God, your love is from everlasting to everlasting. We praise you that in the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, your promises given by the prophets were fulfilled, and the day of our deliverance 
was dawned. As we look for the triumph of his kingdom, we shout with holy joy. How wonderful are your ways. We praise you, most almighty God, for sending your son, your only son, to live among us. And he was full of grace and truth. He made you known to everyone who received him. He shared our joys and our sorrows, healed the sick, was a friend of sinner, sinners, and obeyed you, and ultimately took up his cross in obedience and died so that we might live. So we praise you that Jesus overcame death and is risen to, to rule this world so that we might overcome death as well. He's still the friend of sinners. We trust him to overcome every power that can hurt or divide us. And we believe that when he comes again in all of his glory, we will celebrate victory with him. Let us continue to pray using the words that Christ taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Remembering the Lord Jesus, we break bread and we share this cup. And as we do so, we proclaim his life, his death, and his resurrection until he comes again. Jesus, on the night of his arrest, after blessing bread, he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this, remembering me. He also said, all who come to me will never thirst. All who believe in me shall never hunger. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant poured out in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Or as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches cut off from me you can do nothing. The gifts of God for the people of God. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, you have made us one with all your people in heaven and earth. You have fed us today with the bread of life, and you've renewed us for your service. We give ourselves to you, O Lord, and we are thankful to be a part of the life of your kingdom. May our daily life contribute to it. May our love be your love reaching out into the life of the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray all these things. Amen.
Well, friends, I cannot tell you how happy I am that you were with us in worship today. After getting to share God's Word with you, I am I'm feeling pumped up and inspired. I don't know how you're feeling. I'm hoping you got at least a taste of that. If not, the Holy Spirit just full out washing over you with a sense of, you know what, it's all going to be okay because we have a big, good, loving God. And I am charging you once again to fix your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your gaze upon the Lord and trust that surely salvation can will come to you for your heart is turned toward Him, no matter what kind of waiting game you are in right now. And as you do so, may the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ abide upon you abundantly now and forever. And all God's children said, Amen.